Let's discuss Mezio, a middleware framework allowing you to build elegant middlewares for your applications and also Swool, a PHP extension that allows you to build high-performance applications. Let's also look at how to combine both to get the best of both worlds and highlight how this differs from the traditional Apache or Nginx approaches and pitfalls to be aware of when taking the dive. Dear attendees, Babarinde Odawumi is in front of you. He reached us from the farthest direction this year, from Nigeria, and proved that if you really want to give a talk, nothing is impossible. Babarin, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to appreciate the um, PHP Conpol and team for having me um, come that far to, to make a talk here this morning. Um, so this morning we'll be talking about building fast APIs and middlewares using Mezio and Swall. Um, permit me to take a picture first um, because I think that it will be good for my, um, for my collections. All right. Okay, there we go. Say cheese. All right, thank you. And just in case my wife asks, where have I been in the past couple of days? I have evidence to show that I was in Poland. So, all right, um, so this talk is going to be for 90 minutes, and that's really a long time. So as much as possible, please, um, let's make it a bit interactive. Let's ask questions. Um, feel free to reach out at any point in time. I expect that if you're going to be sitting down for 90 minutes, you may want to use the bathroom, so please feel free. Use the bathroom and try and come back so that we can have a fuller house. All right, thank you. Um, so let's talk about me. Um, my name is Babarinde Odeomi. If you want to know how to pronounce the name, just pronounce every syllable, every vowel, just pronounce everything. Babarinde Odeomi. I'm from Nigeria and I'm founder and senior software architect at abandking.com. Honestly, I gave myself that title. Um, I just decided I need to get a title for myself. So what name should I give myself? And say, okay, let's call it Senior Software Architect. So perhaps maybe after this talk, I may decide I need another title that may look good and you know, slap myself on another title. Anyway, um, I'm a husband of one and a father of two, and I'm also a believer. Um, let's talk about the work that I do. Um, I run Abba and King Systems um, Limited. We're a software house. Um, I lead a fantastic team of designers, front-end and back-end developers. Um, we build systems that make the life of people a bit easier. Hopefully, we can solve all life problems, but we try to make sure that systems that they use are, um, are top-notch. Um, in Nigeria, currently, we design end-to-end -end software systems for digital insurance companies um, from mobile, device, mobile channels, web channels, and all the whole strata, back office channels for users to be able to manage the processes. And sometimes I uh, make contributions in the open source. There's this docu Kubernetes scheduler that, um, that I also make contributions to once in a while. Um, all right, so this is um, the agenda. Three main um, strata, Mezio, Suole, Mezio and Suole. So pr the pronunciation is, is depending on you. You can call it swole, swole, swole. Anyone is fine. Um, quick show of hands. Has anyone heard of Mezio before? All right, few hands. Has anyone used Mezio before? Oh, nobody. Okay. Has anyone heard of swole before? Ah, much more hands. Has anyone used swole before? Ah, okay, great, great. So I have test, um, testifiers, people who can testify to the things I'm going to talk about here. All right, so let's um, go into it. It's a long talk, so I'll try to take it as gradual as, as possible because um, I have the whole time in the world. So, um, All right, so why do um, APIs need to be fast, primarily? Because everyone likes fast things. Everyone likes fast cars. Um, fast houses, no, just everybody likes fast things, basically. And, you know, we live in a world currently where modern front-end frameworks, React, Angular, Vue, and what have you, and the list is endless, have this um, 
lovely concepts of loading all application at once on the browser. So SPAs, or if you, if you call them SSRs or um, PWAs as it were, you have all the entire front-end applications sitting on the browsers of customers. And you realize that the only thing that can slow it down largely is the API calls that it needs to make because the, the, the HTML is already downloaded onto the system and there is really nothing to pull from the server again except for um, calls to the API. So the API, the need for the APIs to be fast is, cannot be overemphasized. Um, then of course you have impatient customers who don't want to look, wait forever before, I mean, when the world where if it doesn't click and responds, then I'm out. So APIs really need to be fast and that demand continues to increase. Um, as we grow on. Now, for us, how do we use Mesio currently? So I would try and um, streamline my conversation around some of the things that we do and the things that we don't do. So for private APIs, so what we call private APIs is basically um, APIs we built, we have a system that we control the front-end application and the private APIs are the APIs that the front-end application will call and in many of the cases, those private APIs would have um, calls, listings, and whatever, so that nobody else can call them. Then, of course, also for public APIs, um, which third parties and you know all other people can use and manage systems or call your APIs from, we also use Mesio for that, and of course for um, long-running jobs as well. All right, so let's um, let's go into Mesio itself. Let's try and um, look through what Mesio is about. So basically, Mesio allows you to write PSR 15 um, middleware applications, largely. Um, and you know, when you create middleware, it allows you to be able to create middleware applications using as many layers of these middlewares and the architecture you can have the flexibility of being able to manage the architecture of the projects you want to use. So um, in the past life, it used to be called um, Zend Expressive. And I think Mesio is, I think is Italian for middle or something like that. I'm not so sure. All right. So what are the features of Mesio? Um, Mesio allows you to write PSR 15 middlewares, as I had said earlier. Um, you can consume PSR 7 messages. I want to believe many of us understand, um, are familiar with PSR, um, the PHP standards that allow interoperability across multiple frameworks. Um, then you are able to route requests to your middlewares. So um, it can work with fast route, which is what I use uh, uh, mostly, um, Aura Router and Laminas Router, which we've used in the past in the Zen framework of the Laminas world. Then Mesio also allows you to be able to do PSR 11 um, dependence injection standards, providing interfaces for the has and the get interfaces. I won't go into the details of that. The implementations that are available are Laminas Service Manager. You have Pimpool and Aura DI. Honestly, I haven't used this two before, but those are the options that you have. Um, then, of course, Mesio allows you to do um, templating using tweaks, uh, plates or laminar's view. Honestly, I have no idea what tweaks and plates are, but laminar's view we've used in the past. Then, of course, um, Mesio allows you to be able to handle um, errors. Now, let's go a bit into middlewares, understanding what a middleware is. And we will talk about middlewares in the context of web applications, because middlewares can also be used in terms of databases, in terms of um, operating systems and the likes. So basically, a middleware is basically code that exists between the request and the response. So you have a request and you have the response and there's something in the middle, which is the middleware, hence the name. And what it does is you can take requests, do perform actions on those requests and either send a response back to the client that is making the request or pass a delegation to another middleware and that middleware would probably do something with that request, do some magic around it and you know pass it to the end of the queue, then send a response back. So for every request in um, HTTP, you get a corresponding response. As well. So middlewares help manage that process um, along the way. 
Now, with this paradigm, what you can do is you can build a workflow, of, a workflow engine for handling your request. So for instance, you could have a single middleware that handles the authentication. Um, you can have another middleware that manages your authorization, have another middleware that manages login and what have you around the whole um, strata of or layers that you are able to come up with. So the value of PSR 15 middlewares is that they, they become building blocks that you can, Lego bricks, um, you can also call them. They are also lightweight, meaning that they may be as simple as you want them to be. Um, they help with the organization of your code, um, making it structured as well. Then, of course, you have reusability, meaning that you can use multiple, the same middleware in multiple requests over time. Then, last but not the least, you have interoperability. And interoperability speaks to, once you have PSR 15 middlewares that currently, um, exist in other frameworks, you can bring those pairs of 50 middlewares into your own system and basically the same standards are applicable to them. So whether it's from Slim or from wherever, you can bring them into Mezio and you have that or vice, vice versa. Okay, sorry. All right. So just a brief to go through what the pairs of 15 um, request handler interface looks like. So um, the PSR 15 re request handler interface exposes um, a function, a handle function. And what the handle function basically does is it handles a request and produces a response. So it, it basically is responsible for managing the transition from one middleware to another middleware. Um, and that's what the, the request, that's the interface that is defined by PSR 15. There's another interface that is defined and these are critical to help us build up to where we're going to. Um, there's another PSR 15 interface, which is the middleware interface. And what the middleware interface provides is a process function. So all PSR 15 middlewares must implement the process function. They will receive a request, which is of the type server request interface. And of course, they will receive the request handler interface, which is also defined previously. And they will always, it must always return a response interface. All right, for those at the back, this may be a little bit blurred, but let me just try and explain how the request cycle is. So when a request is coming into the application, you have, it's a top-down approach. You have requests hitting, this is supposed to be your entire application, which is a stack of all middlewares. So you have middlewares in the green area, you have middlewares in the blue area, and of course you have middlewares in the red areas, which is like the danger zone. All right, so basically the high priority middlewares, these are the middlewares that will manage things like calls to validate whether the request is even allowed, the preferred request is even allowed or not, and you can have some other um, middlewares there. So a request comes in largely, and eventually a response is sent out. So many times you expect this layer to give you the response that the application should provide. Whenever the request hits the button down here, many times you, it means that um, something bad has happened. Um, perhaps a 404 or you know, um, a not found um, route has been, has been requested. So this is basically the structure. Then you have the routing middleware for Mesio. You have the dispatch middleware that calls the routed middlewares which match that. So we'll talk into we'll go into the details of this next. So this is a sample um, snippet of, as, as shown earlier, the first set of um, code are the first one. So you have an error handler here, which is the outermost um, um, middleware. And primarily, this um, error handler is, its primary responsibility is to make sure that whatever is, um, it, it can manage that process. So you have things like the server URL middleware, the cause middleware, which, is, which can help you manage cause um, on your application level. Then you have document, I'll talk about this later. Then you have the route middleware, and you know, these other middlewares help structure um, your, your request objects to whether the request objects are application JSONs or HTML forms requests that are coming in. And of course, you have this method not allowed, so you could be calling a middleware, um, you'll be calling a, 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 a method, maybe a patch me on a route method that doesn't exist. So this method not allowed middleware would throw that out. Then you have 
excuse me, then you have um, other middlewares that you can use problem details and a dispatch, um, the dispatch uh, middleware, which would now speak to the specific endpoint that has been called. Then you have the problem details not found and the not found handler. So basically, every time we call our application, many times the application ideally would, if it is a correct route that has been called or a correct endpoint that has been called with the expected payload, what you'd expect is that this middleware would send the response back. But if it is a wrong one, the not found handler is what is called and the details, error details, and um, the problem details would also be called and the response will be given accordingly. Okay. So let's go into what our route definitions look like um, in, in Mesio. Like I said earlier, um, the, 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 the router that is being used is, um, is fast route. So, um, so but let's take an example. So we have about four endpoints here, a post, a get, another post, another post. And the first, um, just by inspection, you would see that in this, in this construct, signing up of a user is done by a, a user that already exists in the system. So we have a strata. Uh, so this route, this um, block speaks to a post request on the user endpoint. And, um, and this is basically just the name of, of this particular endpoint. And these names are quite particularly useful when you need to define access control on the routes. Now, you have an array of um, FQ um, full class qualified names here, and this is the order in which once a request matches um, the user endpoint with the right payload, this is the order in which it would hit the middleware. So in this case, you see this JWT authentication middleware is used in, in multiple places. You have a find user by email, which is used in about two other places, and you have the other middlewares stacked upon each other. So we expect that the last middleware often will return a response in many cases if the other middlewares did not return a response. All right, so I would go into some details now to show you um, how we're able to structure our code to make it as simple and as elegant. And we'll, we'll look at um, a middleware like find um, user by email. It's used by three guys, but in its set, oh, sorry, by two, two middlewares, and we'll look at its implications in both cases. So we have a middleware called find user, called find user by um, email, and the name is simple. Basically, we have an email address that is coming from a post, for example, and all it does is you just wants to be sure whether an email exists. So we do our sessions here. So um, in, in you can you can access your post. Um, your post body by calling this request past body will give you the post information. Then you can do some assertions to say is this is a valid email. Is there an email in the first place in the post? If it is, that's fine. Is it even a valid email address? Then we can throw the exceptions as a case. Then of course here you see we're calling our repository to find um, the email, find by this email address. Now two things are likely to happen: is either it's there or it's not there. And in this case, when it's there, we, we, do, we call the handler, but we modify the request object that is going to go to the next middleware by adding an attribute. So we define a with attribute user class, and we define the user. Ooh, was that me? I think I need some help. He's back. All right, he's back. Thank you. All right. Um, now, it's also possible that the user is, doesn't exist, and but we still need to call the next handler. Now, the beautiful thing about this middleware is it just does what it's supposed to do. If it doesn't find anything, it doesn't see anything. It finds it, attaches it, and sends it to the next middleware. Now, the next middleware, like I said earlier, as I said earlier, in the stack of middlewares, the, in, the, in the case of the sign-up user, after the find user by email middleware, the next user is, the next middleware is create user. But in the case of, um, yeah, in the case of the log user in the next middleware is, is check password. So the interpretation of 
whatever results happen to find user by email is done by the next middleware. Then it really just so obviously when I'm creating a new user. Okay, so in Mesio, one of the ways you can, you know, in the in the previous um, in the previous middleware, I actually defined um, the width attributes, meaning that I'm saying that the next handler that is going to use this middleware must uh, can access it using this user class. So in the next middleware, what I'm doing is I'm getting that same attribute out into this variable, and I want to check whether the user whether there is a user. Obviously, um, if I'm creating a user in this middleware and a user already exists with that same email address, then I should throw an exception and say the user exists. And if the user doesn't, if there's no user, then I know I'm safe. Then I can go ahead and create user in this case. However, in the next middleware, what you will realize is that we do the same thing. We get the attribute of the user. But now we want to be sure that the user exists in this case. So if there is no user, then we are worried because you can't log in without. Then at that point, we cannot throw our exception to say incorrect credentials because that user doesn't exist in our system. So what we have is we've been able to have a middleware that actually in the first instance just does finding users by email and doesn't do any other thing and allows the next middlewares to interpret the results of the previous middleware based on its own knowledge or based on its own intentions. So the intentions of create user is different from the intentions of check password user, but they use the same middleware to do whatever things they need to do. And that's one of the beautiful things. And of course, you can now pull that user out, do the credential details, and set everything you need to set. Then in this case, um, you can also update the user and call the next middleware, and so on and so forth. OK. Um, so, like it's also shown, um, so this is one mechanism of um, st structuring requests and middlewares. In this case, our middlewares are full-fledged classes in PHP implementing that interface. But there are also instances where, uh, and don't blame my code, please. It's basically for demonstration purposes. Um, so, I have. I can also write this block from line three to line 15. Sorry, from line three to line 12 itself is a middleware as well. And, and what it's doing basically is doing a match function to help me determine who um, the type of customer this is and provide that attribute to the next middleware. So what it does also is that I have only one check customer that checks based on the customer type that I have. So I can hack, um, I, can, I can determine who um, my customer type is based on this middleware here. Or let me also mention that um, using fast route, one of the ways you can access attributes on the route is by calling get attribute as well with the name on the route here. And I'll be able to access. So, I have different types of customers and I can do all sorts of things that I need to do here. Now, in the next case, which is also similar, um, I have the JWT authentication. I have a check proposal middleware that probably sets checks to validate whether a proposal with the ID exists in my DB and makes that available to the next middleware. Now, in the next middleware, um, I am interested in getting that proposal out from the system and setting the attribute type of the customer from the object that was that was validated here. And I can now set that attribute here and check customer can also use that same attribute here. So you have this construct where you can have um, brief um, uh, middleware functions defined in your code without having to create a new class so that you don't have too many classes. So this is um, also a possibility. So, um, all right. I hope I haven't. I hope I hope I'm I'm doing well so far. This is my first PHP talk, so I hope I'm not doing badly. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the encouragement. All right. So, um, so you have basically to to get started on a um, um, on a measure project. All you just need to do is call Composer, create the project, and you know there's a skeleton application that you can use. And of course, you have the guide on the getting started. Um, um, 
for 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 Mezio as well. There. Um, so there are other mid middlewares that Mezio provides that you can easily just install and plug in. One of them is the problem details. And for those of um, just in case you don't know what problem details is, problem details largely is, um, helps you structure problems, errors from your code. How you respond back to the clients is a structured format um, that allows you to be able to do that neatly for whoever is consuming your APIs. Um, then, of course, you have cores as well, which is cross origin requests sharing, I think. You have that midway so you can define which, um, which domains can call your, your, your endpoints or which domains can call your, your whole application as a whole. Um, you have um, HAL, honestly, I've never used it before. Then, of course, you have CSRF. Then you have authorization, which is either RBAC, role-based access control or access control list as well. And you have others that are available on, on their website. All right. So, the next is Swarm. I just want to um, catch a breath a little bit. It's, it's been a very fast one. Um, so, because I know it's a long one, um, I just wanted to share a couple of anecdotes. Um, so, Mezio originally, Mezio, like I said earlier, is from Zend Expressive, and um, Zend used to have this Zen framework. Now it's called Laminas, uh, Zen framework one, two, and three back then, and the first time I was going to write Zen Framework 1, I spent about three days solving the getting started part. It was really, really difficult. But these days, it gets simpler and simpler by the day. Okay, right. So let's take it up a little bit. Um, this is where the magic happens, Swall. So, um, Swall is is an event-driven, um, asynchronous, coroutine-based concurrency library with high performance for PHP. It's a lot of grammar, but um, so basically, with Swole, you can create your own HTTP server. You can have web sockets. You can have TCP server, UDP servers. You can have coroutines. And there are two variants, um, Swole and Open Swole. I won't go into the politics of this, but I'll just tell you that there are two variants. Make your choice. All right. And so let's look at what um, an HTTP server looks like in Swole, just on the elementary level. You know, when you are in class, your teachers always do the simple things, then they give you the homeworks, always the hard ones. So let's do the simple ones. All right, so you can create a new HTTP server by calling this. Um, um, then you can register callbacks on this event. So um, um, Swole has about 10 main events, some on, um, but particularly at least on the HTTP side. Um, you have the on start, um, you have the start events, you can register what happens when the start event is triggered on Swole. You can register, you know, what will happen when the request, um, um, the request event happens also in Swole and define basically a header and give a response. So that's how simple it is to create a server in Swole. But really, applications are often not as simple as this, but it can be as simple as this. Um, yes. Um, yes, so that's, that's what you have. Of course, you have other events that you can also hook up to um, the, the task events, the finish events, the manager start, manager stop. And you have all so many events, but this is just for the sake of examples. Um, then, of course, you can also create a WebSocket um, server just easily. You, have, you can register. The same paradigm follows. You have the start events, the open events, the message events, the close events. You can define callbacks for each of these events. And I know this may look like Node.js, but um, this is PHP as well. So um, then, of course, you can now start the server. Then, of course, you can also create HTTP servers. And you, know, you have the start events, the connect events, and what have you. Honestly. I haven't had any cost to use the TCP servers or the UDP servers. I haven't had any cost to do that. But I know it's there, so please, if you, find, if you have any use cases for this, you can always pick it up and, and go on on it. OK, so also, um, you have um, coroutines available on Swole. And this is one of the power tools that you have available on Swole. 
where you can um, you can run concurrency operations. So you can have you can define your coroutines. Uh, in this case, it's a coroutine join where you can have two operations run concurrently. Um, so this is a short cut also for initiating your coroutines. You can see that the results are you know referenced. Um, um, in both of the cases, and you can have your coroutine. So we'll go into more details of this as I, as I, um, as I proceed. Um, then, of course, um, you can also have concurrency, and this is where the magic is. Um, you can run over 10,000 requests to read data from MySQL, and it only take about 0 0.2 seconds. So you have this concurrency wired in, and you know you can call, run this. So please take time. You can have your time to run tests around this for those of you who have not gone through this. And this is really, really mind blowing. Um, okay, so these are just um, examples. So let's get into um, Swell itself. So for the normal traditional PHP, obviously you have your web server, whether it's Nginx or, um, or Apache or Kadi or whatever web server you have, uh, or even the PHP server in the, in the the one that comes with the development engine. Um, then once you you've hit your request, you know PHP pro get, uh, process is called. Your application is bootstrapped and loaded. You know your frameworks and everything and all the things that you have is is done here. You know the request is going to be processed, and you will um, give a response in this case. And once that has been done, everything is disposed, and you know you start. So the next request, you have to repeat the whole process all over again. And I think I heard a talk from Bohuslav saying that even um, you, I think about half of the memory is released or something like that, whenever. So you understand the, the, the challenge. So for every PHP request, your whole application needs to be bootstrapped from scratch, framework, or everything needs to be done. And well, these days you have that kind of um, efficiency. Yes, you still get good results, but I think we can do better. Um, so, yeah. Now, on Swole's first request, it will basically do the same thing. It will hit its own web server, bootstrap the application if you have structured it well, you know, dispatch a web worker, we'll talk about this, process the request, and the, return, the response is returned. Now, the next request that you will make to Swole, it doesn't need to bootstrap the application and the application is already residing in memory. So the application in memory is what is going to be used to handle your subsequent HTTP request. And how does Swole do um, um, how does Swole do this? So Swole has um, um, a master process, you have a manager, then you have work workers, um, event workers, um, sorry, or web workers as you call them, or server workers then you have task workers. And the responsibility, once the application is, is loaded, the application is actually loaded primarily here. And the responsibility of the manager is to manage all those workers. Whenever there's a failure in one of those workers, the responsibility of the manager is to restart that worker to make sure that you have um, um, your worker is up and running, even when a failure occurs in one worker. Now, should I also mention that for each of these web workers, they pick a copy of the application that has already been loaded in memory, and that is what is run. It, they have a copy of this in memory, and it introduces a couple of potential issues. Yes, it gives you the value and the speed, because now you don't have to reload your application on every request. So let's talk about this. So Swole actually runs the main process, which you know bootstraps the PHP application once, and it keeps it in memory so that you can continue dispatching requests without having to load resources every time. And that's what really makes it fast. Now, whenever an HTTP request is being called, a web worker is going to be triggered. So which I showed you earlier, those are the workers. So what Swole does is I fox the content of that worker in memory from the main process to each of those workers. So each worker has a copy of the application in memory and can do um, whatever it should do. Each of the workers are independent, but each one of them can only handle one, of the, one request at a time. So in some cases, you may have to increase the number of workers that you have, or you may, particularly if you expect a lot of concurrent traffic. So 
scaling is easier because all you need to do is as much as you have a, a memory you can scale up many web workers to be able to handle the traffic um, um, the traffic here of course like you realize because everybody is taking a copy of this in memory and each of these guys has what we should be concerned about is what was loaded in the first instance how was it loaded in the first instance because if everybody has a copy of what was loaded it means that there's a tendency that when there's a change from one of the workers in a request it will affect all the other workers as well i would show examples of this and why this would all right so let's combine them together mesio and you have swall so basically to install um, swall you just is a because swall is a is a php extension you can just call peckle install swall or peckle install open swall depending on the choice that you want to have and a mesio swall um, you can do a composer require for the mesio swall um, which will have everything set up for you and of course you can start your application run this when you start your application you use you have you can set your configurations on the things that you want to set up um, in your configuration for the sword or local PHP or the global one so you can define what your server will look like the host the party to use the number of web workers that you want to have and the work number of task workers that you want to have and you have um, you have task enabled routines let me quickly talk about a difference between web workers and task workers so web workers primarily which is um, signified here largely are the ones that will handle your web request task workers are largely used for specific tasks and you want to use tasks for long-running processes um, in your system so in some cases instead of having to use a message queue you can just have a task do that job on a long um, run we'll talk more about that of course you can also have coroutines in your task um, workers to be able to add some spice so of course once you have your application running you have something like this, this is my own log showing that swell is running on that particular machine and that particular port and you know this is my so I have eight workers four web workers and four task workers all right so let's go back to middlewares and see the value that swell gives us in our middleware so I have um, a middleware called send OTP um, and basically I what it should do is um, be able to send a one-time password to um, to users to whoever is logged in or whoever wants to log in so I'm able to get my attributes from the preceding middleware here and because my Mailer service many times will probably be an external service. I probably be using Send Grid or or Mailchimp or whatever. Um, no adverts. Um, I'm, this will take a long time for it to run, and I don't want my customer, my user, to know that it's going to take x number of seconds for this to connect to that server. So what I do is I put it inside a coroutine and I return a response to the customer. So the user doesn't know that something is going on the user just sees that I've gotten a response so in a process of time the email will come or the SMS will come and the user can now proceed so the value of hiding long-running um, finite processes in this coroutine is that it allows you to be able to give response back to the customer or the user without the user knowing that so many things are going on at the background so you, other use cases where you find value is this you may be logging your request every request that sits in your server the user doesn't need to know that you are running a log or you are calling um, um, data dog or you know whatever log logger um, whatever third party services you are using you can just put it inside a coroutine and once that request is coming you can send it over to them so that so that's a value of coroutines it gives speed to the customer and the customer will will have an impression that everything is fine okay so let's um, look at um, tasks so in this cases I, I, I would be going through showing a lot of code and just walking through some of the things that you are able to do and structure the code so please just bear with us we'll be going into a lot of code now so 
like I mentioned, um, the purpose of a task worker is I want to do a long-running job, a job that would um, send, you know, those dead-end jobs that you probably use a message queue for. So basically, a task worker should do that. And um, like mentioned earlier, um, uh, Mesio provides um, a dependency injection layer using the service manager, and you can define um, so I just talked about this. You can define aliases for services, invocable services. You can define factories, and you can define what we call delegators. We'll talk a lot about delegators in this case. So um, in the concept of factories, every time I call request for this in my, system, in, in, in my application, the factory basically is going to be called to instantiate the object and give me the object back. And of course, um, you have all the other things. So, Sol, um, I'm sorry, Mesio provides um, these dependencies, global or config providers, for you to be able to wire your classes and you know define a lot of factories of how your objects will be created. All right. So look, this is what my. So in this case, I have what I call um, a delegator. For in case you don't know what a delegator is, what it is is that any time the service. Um, um, the service, um, the service manager, or the DIC container is instantiating um, this server class. It's going to call this task del worker delegator to decorate, um, to decorate this class. So in this case, every time I want to get a server object, it will. This is basically the server object that I have gotten then I can now decorate it so I can hook into it and define the task events. I talked about events on the server object of, of, of SWOL earlier, and I can now define what should happen anytime a task is called. So in this case, I have my task worker here. It has a factory, and that factory picks an AWS recognition service that we've built um, to be able to do a facial recognition which, like you understand, will take a long time for it to, to get done. So um, we provide that recognition service, and this is what the task worker looks like. So every time I call the task, I have this service, and I can tell it to detect a face in this case. This will normally take a long time to do, and that's why we put it in a task. So in the middleware, once I have, I have hit this middleware in my application, the next thing I'm able to do is that I can do some stuff, create my objects from here, and in line 26, I'm able to tell the task, call the task to take action on this particular object that I've given it. So at the end of the day, this task is going to be called, and my response will be given back to the client who is calling this midway. And the value is that this task will take a long time, and that's not the customer's business or the client's business. So it can now do everything it needs to do, get the data out and do the recognition and you know, finish it offline. And that's one of the values um, with, um, with, with um, using task workers. Then the next thing is um, you have um, cron tab. So you are able to define cron jobs on, on Swole, for example. And it's very interesting. So of course, this is a cron schedule. And this is an event I want to, um, um, uh, this is an event I have mapped to trigger every time, which is basically every five minutes. But just ignore the name and just don't just, it's just an event. So I have a schedule that runs, I want to run every five minutes, basically. And this is basically just an event. So the next array will just be another job, I have that listed there. Now what is interesting, I spoke about delegators earlier. So there's a listener provider that is available that I can choose to decorate in, um, in, in, in to be able to maximize, to be able to run my, my, my cron jobs on it. Then I have this also, which I will talk about. So let's go into the details of this, of how I'm going to decorate this. Uh, so this is a bit tiny, but just bear with me. So I have this, um, um, like I said, for, a for, for the delegator basically is to allow me to be able to decorate 
um, the service that is going to be created. So I can pick this provider, which is which is the service listener provider that was created. I can pick it and register an event this, because this is a listener. I can define this server start event. So every time I server start, call this function. So in this function, I have my container, dependency injection container, and my cron which is basically a list. So I've skipped some of the code, but it's just so that we have an idea. So I have a dispatcher, which is able to dispatch. Then I have registered. There's a timatic function that allows me to run every minute. So every minute, this block of code will be run every time. So the moment my server starts, it registers this event as part of my application. And what it does is that I can I trade through a list of cron jobs that I've put in my schedule. I have I can also there's this cron extension library provided available, and I can check for each of those jobs that I have that I have listed here for each of these jobs. Sorry. For, uh, so for each of these jobs, I can check whether that cron job is due. If it is due, then I can trigger the event to say, I can now dispatch it. So there's a lot of events, um, 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 dispatching of events in this architecture. Now, I have a second um, decorator that I use to decorate this sole listener provider and is also registering my own, my listener. So whenever I see this event, I must call this, um, um, I must be able to attach it to provide this as um, the service that will run anytime this event exists. So this is also um, interesting. And so what happens is that at the point where the cron job is going to trigger, all it does is pull up these structures and you know it will call the invoke method, and I can do the stuff that I need to do, and and you know you can flush this. So this gives you a really interesting perspective of how you can create runners, and you know I'm, I'm sorry, cron jobs, endless cron jobs, and what the cron jobs will do is it'll pick a task worker from the memory and run the job, do whatever it needs to do, and wait till the next time is going to happen again. Um, from experience, um, we ran into an issue once, and in the process of learning, in the process of trying out new things, there's a tendency that you want, you also learn, um, you learn, you make mistakes, and you learn from those mistakes. So, um, in our learning of, of, um, of, on, on Swole and Mesio, when we were creating these cron jobs, by the way, um, this actually was inspired by this. Um, Cron mechanism was inspired by an article written by um, MWP. Um, I don't know if you know him, but that's what I call him anyway. So that was how we came about this. Now, one of the things that we learned was initially we were not using the dependency injection container to get the object manager here. We did, we, we started noticing some erratic behaviors um, because we had some um, ideally we had some buggy code actually that was killing our object manager. Now, the other alternative would have been to have in, put the, injected this object manager in the constructor in the first instance, instead of using the container. But if we do that, what it means is that the object manager will be instantiated at the point of when you're starting up the application. So the object manager is live. And that's always a bad idea, because when the object manager dies, it affects everybody. Or when you call it persist or a flush, Every other, every other um, user of this object manager will have to close out because that's what's been caused. So this sometimes can be very, very dangerous. And of course, um, object manager is related to doctrine. I, I didn't ask if we had people who use doctrine here. So do we have people who, use, who are familiar with doctrine? All right, so. All right, so. Um, there are performance benchmarks. I didn't run any, so you, there are links there. By the way, the slide is also available on speaker deck, so you can look at the benchmarks that have been run by anything. So if somebody has done it, there's no need for you to also do it. So that's basically on that. Now, let's talk about the potential issues that, which I have mentioned some of them, but I can go into details of some of them. So you have long running processes, um, and I think uh, Bogislav also talked about this. So in your web workers, your web workers, you are trying to avoid, to make sure your web workers are not doing too many things. And if your 
web workers are running long running processes, it means that the next request will fail because if you have exhausted all your web workers, then there's nobody to respond to the next request. So you want to make sure that you are not having long running processes in your web workers. And also avoid using sessions because of the shared memory, um, the shared um, um, architecture that is available there. Then thirdly, ensure you have stateless services. The impact on the dependency for concurrent or subsequent requests can be very, very crazy. So I, 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 would, I think I have about two scenarios in managing um, state in third party services. So for example, if you, Doctrine is an object manager that allows an ORM or ODM in our case, we use MongoDB, so we use the um, object data document mapper, but of course the same thing applies to the object relational. Um, so we'll talk about that. Then of course you also have services that you are consuming that really don't know what is going on inside of them and it's risky to use them in Soul without managing any, any, um, any behaviors. In regular PHP, once you call that service, if it's a, um, the one that easily comes to mind, let's just use a send grid library. You want to send an email, you just call it, it sends it, and that's the end. The next one will create a new one, and it sends it. But in this case, the next one is not going to create a new one. It's basically just using the one that has been created. So you must manage, you must understand, you, you may not know what is going on in send grid's code, right? You may not know what's going on because the design of many developers or many third party systems as, as much as possible try to be agnostic but they will still do funny things because in PHP you expect that things should just go fire and forget but in the case some things may still be held back and you want to be very very careful so one of the things we do is that we provide um, a very interesting so we have um, um, so you have what we call the factory method or we call it a factory factory, and it's a bit interesting. So you have this factory, ideally, which should actually create us a blob REST proxy from um, Azure's blog storage service, and we wire up all the configurations there. But we know that if we call this guy directly in our code, if the first um, blob proxy, something happens to it, and we don't know, we don't have knowledge about its internals, then we may be stranded in calling it the next time. So what we do is that we wrap it, we put it, we have a factory factory that will pick this factory and return it in a callable mechanism so that whenever we need to, so then we have this service basically which is going to consume our factory factory and register this in our system. Now. What is the value for us? In the service that will eventually do the upload or whatever that we want to run, we will, you know, in the instantiation of this factory, we are going to define it as a closure from callable, blah, blah, blah. But every time we need to do an upload, we call this get client, which instantiates the client that we actually need, which is the Blobrex factory client that we need, at the point where the upload is being done. So we're sure that every time we call this guy, we have a new instance of the Blobrex proxy at every point in time that we can do whatever things we want to do, do the upload, and you know, and the, that's the end of the service. Now, interestingly, so what it means is that the next guy who is coming will just basically do the same thing it doesn't know about what the web worker has done previously and is done. So web workers are able, you are able to protect yourself by using this mechanism to get new instances of objects at the point where you need them the most. And once they are done, that's the end. The next one will be a new one that you will create and it gives you that, neat, that neatness and protects you from a lot of trouble. Now, the next one is doctrine. Um, and this was a big problem, uh, but thanks to this guy, sorry, the article is a bit tiny. He wrote a piece about how to manage, um, um, how to manage um, the entity manager. Uh, of course, you know, for those of you who are familiar with doctrine, um, there are a couple of peculiarities where you have the unit of work mechanism where 
Um, you can persist as much as you so flush only flushes everything at once. And it's important because um, it, it can be dangerous because if you don't manage it well, Mr. A can be calling your middleware innocently and he's fetched in his own call, he will fetch an object of a user type and Mr. B is also making that same call. And because it's doctrine, doctrine will just say, okay, who is this user? Particularly if he's a logged in user. Who is the logged in user? He just picks that data and gives the rights of Mr. A to Mr. B without knowing. So it becomes tricky because it's shared. And in, in, in such cases, it can be very interesting. So what you want to do is you want to use, also use a delegator mechanism. So for delegator, I any mean, time the object manager is going to be created, we hook it, we decorate it with this um, piece of code. All right. So, um, so this is what our delegator looks like. Our delegator just creates what we call a decorator. I don't mind the name. The name comes from here. So, um, so you have this doc, doc decorator manager, um, document manager decorator. That's what VS Code did. That's not me. So, it just creates um, a decorator for us. And decorators are valuable because what it does is that you are able to also use a similar mechanism to initialize, to, to, to set up the constructor with a fresh instance of the, 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 um, um, the, the object manager. So every time, what this guarantees us is that every time you are calling the request, you are getting you know, a new instance of the object manager. Then you can call the create DM and do all the things that you need to do. I would go into this constructor shortly, I think. And of course, you can also check whether it's, if, 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 um, if, if the connection is opened, if it is opened, they are fine. If it is not opened, you can just create a new one and set it as wrapped. So the wrapped is actually used in the parent constructor here. And what it does is that it just picks the object manager and maps it as wrapped. So what we had to do in this case, which was the tricky part, in, in, in the ORM, in Doctrine's ORM, they already have um, decorators for their ORMs. But in Document Manager, we didn't have a decorator. So we needed to write our own decorator. And the decorator is just basically repeating everything that is in the real code in your decorator, but just passing this dot wrapped is equal to, um, just passing, instead of calling the object directly, you're just using this um, instance of document manager is what you're using to call the same function that is defined. So it's basically not doing anything. So you'll see that it's implementing this object manager decorator and also implementing the object manager here. So we are guaranteed that every time, every time we are calling our middleware, um, oh shoot, I, I missed the slide. So um, just a second. I want to try and go as far back. I, I give an example. Okay, so in our situation, so every time a request is coming, I, I showed this pipeline earlier. Anytime a request is coming to our middleware, any new request, we always call this document manager middleware to help us manage the current state of our document manager, just to be sure whether the document manager is still alive or is dead. And that document manager middleware is somewhere down here. Sorry. All right, so this is that middleware. So what that middleware does is it receives that decorator and tries, you know, and basically just opens it, clears any, um, if there's any other thing, then calls the handler handle middleware to go to the next thing. So it prepares our object manager ready for execution at the point where we need it. And you know, basically in our code, we can now call the object manager and just persist and flush. And basically on its way, if there's any exception that happens here, we can all basically just close it and clear it on this. All right, so um, there are resources that are available online for to be able to manage this well. You have the, um, the, 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 the site for Mesu itself and that of um, SWO. 
Um, there's also this wonderful site, which is Swole by Examples. You can go through it. There are tons and tons of examples in which you can use to learn Swole. Then, of course, you have... Um, um, Swole is also available on Docker, so you can also manage um, your Docker. You can also use it on Docker, which is what we do. And you have Awesome Swole as well, which is also a bunch of libraries. There are other frameworks that also use Swole, HyperF, and tons and tons of them like that. Um, um, Lar Laravel, I think, also has some libraries on that. All right, that's the end of my talk. Wait, one hour plus. Thank you for listening. Thank you for waiting around. All right. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a bit in, um, funny drive, but I think I should be able to take some questions now. And please, let's be free to ask those questions. Um, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question because you have shown us how you can send an email with coroutines. Yeah, but uh, how you deal with some edge cases like, for example, you can get a uh, timeout, how you can replay these tasks, and what if you I would like to res reschedule it for the next day because some services is not available. How you can do that? Okay, um, so. If you look at the code that we have here, there's a mailer service here, right? And this mailer service is responsible for everything that has to do with managing the, dispatch, the dispatching of the email. So your retries and whatever can be in this mailer service to manage how you retry and you know set your retry rules and whatever as well. So we have that here. Now there are cases. I mean, in this case. Is a, this is a transactional email. You need, the customer needs to be able to put in, get that email. This is a, a, a one-time password, basically. And so you want the customer to be able to get that quickly so that the login process can be completed. This will be different from a long-running job where you have, you need to send emails to customers, maybe renewal notices and whatever. Then you can build structured jobs for that, which you can use cron jobs for, to be able to build um, a, a much more flexible architecture for you to be able to help you retry sending emails, manage the ones that failed and recue them and so on and so forth. So you can use long running tasks for those ones. Okay, so is. there is no a native solution to deal with with school. With that cases, you ca you uh, have to uh, deal with uh, on my own, yeah? I okay. have created a logic to uh, retry myself, yeah? The, for example, sending those mail if I uh, have a timeout. For example, yeah. Yes, so you, right, can, yeah? you can you can do retries if you are using the HTTP client of of Swall, right? Okay. But in this case, um, I could be using SendGrid to dispatch the emails out for me, right? Okay. So it is when I get the response for SendGrid that I know that it's actually valid because this is most likely going to be an API call to SendGrid, as an example. But if you are using, uh, if it is not emails, for example, if it's um, you are calling an endpoint, maybe an, another API, for example. You can have your own wired architecture to be able to use um, your, the HTTP client because the HTTP client that comes with um, with um, with Swole really is quite robust as well. Allows you to do retries and what have you. Okay, okay. I get it. Thanks. Yes, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, what's the memory consumption of the bootstrap swall? Okay, uh, you mean the, the memory footprints? Yeah. Okay, so I think um, if I'm going to answer that, it's largely around, um, it's, it's largely going to be determined on the structure of the code that you're going to be running. What's your full, uh, what's your, your, um, um, the entire code base is, is consuming the memory. It's lightweight, uh, majorly. Um, we've we've not had as much memory concerns when it comes to school. But again, you want to look at the number of workers that you have. Um, so the number of workers that you have would also um, determine how much memory are you are you're, use, you're going to be using, whether they're web workers or task workers, as it were. So that's that's how I can answer that. 
Is it okay. clear as luck? Thanks, yes. Right. Who's next? Be careful. Now I get Finally. Thank you for your presentation. Very, very nice. Uh, oh, it was? Yeah, oh, I, I enjoyed it. So I want to ask you about this uh, middleware concept, especially how do you approach testing uh, such methods like you showed before? Is this the level that you actually create tests on this process method level, or do you test it on some different level? OK, so um, uh, where is this? So this is the process method, right, which is required by the middleware, middleware interface. So yes. is this the level that you write unit tests, for example, for? OK, so in my, in my, in my experience, um, the tests that we run primarily are on domain related, the, the unit tests that we run, which is using PHP spec, are on domain level, domain level code, basically. So the one that talks about the, the knowledge of the core in itself. Um, in this case, basically, in, in the attempt to, um, um, to test this, one of the things that you are able to do with PHP spec, you can, you can um, also write your specs on this, on this point as well to be able to manage on, on the process um, endpoint, then you have to do a lot of stubbing and mocking and what have you at this point. So it depends on, on the paradigm or the perspective that you work with. For some of us, we just um, spend most of our testings on the domain level as well. Okay. So I understand that this is not exactly the level that you suggest to test directly. So um, in this case, yes, you can, you can write tests here actually. Yes, so you can write your test here. But um, so for testing, the way we perceive testing is at this point, in this middlewares, that basically um, um, the value of the value at this point is basically we are much more um, interested in integration tests for this, actually. That's our interest here because really what we want to check for failure is that we want to be sure our mode is with respect to our own um, unit tests are focused on domain knowledge as well. So for here, integration test is largely the primary um, um, value for us that we get from it. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Uh, do you test the chain of those uh, middlewares? For example, if you have like for uh, middleware in one endpoint, do you test the endpoint itself using the, I don't know, some, some sort of API test, or do you test the chain as functional tests? Yes, so you, you know, with the chain, uh, I want to get to that chain now. So with chain, you mean this chain? Yeah, yeah. So for example, do you test like um, the first three or just all as the, in the endpoint? So if you're going to test this endpoint, this is largely going to be for us on an integration level, basically. So we've prepared. OK, um, so we have this um, um, open API that defines, helps define you know, mm -hmm. our request and our response. And that helps with testing of this endpoint, the expected the example uh, payloads and, you know, and the responses that you will get from it. So we have that. Um, at that level. But again, um, which is interesting because um, if you have um, the behavior of each of these guys is independent largely. They're not, they are supposed to be self existing entity um, um, uh, middlewares. It really is not really concerned with the next middleware or, well, maybe sometimes with the previous middleware because it just wants to know what is available for it to work with. So, um, Yes, so we're able to do that using our page open API spec, and you're able to manage that. Why I'm asking is because using the middleware, there is an easy option to do an error when it comes like the one if is missing from the next one, and someone thought it should be in the previous one. So you're like missing some sort of security stuff, and it can be found on the like top of the top of the pyramid of tests. But usually, I always have problem like to understanding where in the middleware 
it should be tested as well. Okay. Maybe some sort of connection like between two middlewares. Okay, so if I, if you're, what you're saying is that there may be a missing um, attribute from here in this place, which is why I said that you know the knowledge of um, the knowledge that is available here, right, is largely depending on whatever has come before it. So I must, to an extent, be able to simulate that call to be able to know where the failure is from those ends, and which is an example for us. Okay, so hi. Uh, I got a question about m managing the memory leaks because we've got a swool with long running processes. Sorry, I, I didn't. Okay, uh, how do you manage memory leaks in long running processes with swool? Do, is there an issue or it's somehow magically solved? Yes, it is, um, it is an issue. And frankly, uh, one of the ways we run that, um, particularly on our cron jobs, is to um, is to reduce the footprint, reduce um, um, the chunks that we're processing at the same time. Since we can define it to we can define the frequencies that we want it to run, we reduce the chunks, and um, that's how we're able to run it. So that so that we don't have all this um, drama. So um, a couple of days ago, we had this long running process that we found out was also having those issues and what we needed to do was just reduce the chunks. I mean, for we are also in a learning process, so we're also able to, I mean, we're not the perfect, I'm not the perfect swell guy or the mesio guy. I'm also just also learning and, you know, it would be good to share ideas to understand what other people do and how they're able to manage that and we're able to learn from that. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions? All the questions came from here. <laughs> Okay, any questions from here? All right. Oh, you have another one? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much. We have about 19 more minutes or so to the end of the talks, but please have a, have a good lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>